Hello and welcome to another tutorial video and today I'm going to be talking all about how to use composition in wildlife photography. I'm going to give you some guidelines as to how you can improve your composition in photography. I'm also going to show you some example images I've taken myself which illustrate that as well. So what exactly is composition? I was going to look up some definition or photography definition but I never did. I'm going to give you my definition of composition. So I think it's basically it's how you position the subject in the frame to make it more interesting for the viewer and maybe more pleasing to the eye and also I think it's how you use the elements, all the elements within the frame, it's how you use those together to make it more pleasing and also to draw attention to the image. So very simply, the first thing is putting the subject to one side. So this is where you've got a static subject and rather than just putting it slap bang in the center, as some people do, it's often better just to put it to one side of the image. So I've got an example here of a female bullfinch uh, on a perch that I've set up. And if you notice that the bird is just slightly to the right of center. So you don't have to go overboard with this. You don't have to put it right over to one side. It's really just a little bit to the side. And also when you do that, you are giving a little bit more space in front of the subject. So it's kind of looking into space. So what you want to do is try and make sure that you have more space in front of the subject where it's looking than you do behind it. Now I think this is particularly important with a moving subject. You definitely want to leave more space in front of the subject. It just gives the impression that that's where it's going, that's where it's moving into. So a bird in flight is a typical example. I would try and aim for the head as much as possible. It can be difficult to do, but if you aim more for the front of the bird, then naturally the rest of the body is going to be behind and you're going to get that extra space in front. And the same can be said of animals. So a running animal such as this red deer, Again, it's, it's not massively to one side, it's just enough that there is more space in front of the animal than there is behind it. Again, just giving you that feeling of moving into that space. It might not just be moving left to right or right to left, it could be going up, and up or down as well. So in this picture of a red kite which has just entered a dive, uh, it was kind of like this composition already, but I've also enhanced the composition a little bit, cropping it in post-processing. So what I've tried to do is leave some space uh, towards the left-hand side, which is where it's going, but I've also positioned the bird towards the top of the frame. So it's also giving that feeling of the bird coming down. It's coming down from the top into that empty space. So it's kind of over to the top right, and I think that is a really nice composition. But of course, like lots of things, uh, the rules don't always apply and sometimes they just don't work in your favour. So I'm going to give you an example here, which is this coot running on the water. And again, it's a moving subject, so you'd think that it'd be better to put the bird to one side to give it more space to move into. But in this case, it actually, I don't think it works as well. The reason being that with the coots and, and lots of water birds, when they try and take off the, from the water, they'll run along the water creating these splashes behind them. And what that does is add something else to the frame, to the composition. So here, I knew this was gonna happen, I've seen it a number of times. So I've tried to compose the picture uh, with the coot actually to the right hand side, which is the opposite of what you'd usually do. And what that's done is allow those splashes behind the coot to be included in the frame. So sometimes the rules are not gonna apply. It really depends on the subject and everything else that is happening in the frame. Just a quick word about which direction the subject's actually looking or going into, which is quite interesting. So you can find this stuff, uh, if you look online, you'll, you'll find this. It's a psychological thing that basically it's much better going from left to right. So we tend to read from left. I think we start top left and read across. So it's very similar when we're looking at an image that the eye starts there and goes left to right. So it does seem to be the case that images are more eye-catching, get a bit more attention if they're going left to right rather than right to left. So you might want to consider if you've got if you've got a subject that's looking from the right to the left, you might want to consider just literally flipping it around in post-processing. There are times where it's actually going to be better to put the subject in the middle of the frame. And I find if you've got something that's just literally staring you in the face directly, uh, it's really nice and symmetrical, then I say a lot of the time it's best to just put it dead centre, no need to put it to one side of the frame. So this is an example here of, uh, of a captive red kite photographed on one of my bird of prey workshops. And it was just really staring directly at us as a group. 
and it just looks really nice, really nice symmetry either side. The light isn't perfectly symmetrical, but the bird pretty much is. So rather than put it to one side, I've just gone slap bang in the center of the frame and then I've actually done a bit of cropping. I've done a bit of cropping after just to take out some more of the space. The rule of thirds, you've probably heard this rule. Uh, a lot of you will know what the rule of thirds is. Well, basically it's a, it's a really good guide as to how you can split up your frame and where to position the subject to make it more pleasing to the viewer. And what we basically do is we draw two lines down and two lines across. So we kind of split it up into thirds going down and thirds going across. And we'll have four points where those lines um, intersect, cross one another. And if you position the subject on those points, you often get a much better composition. So in this example of a herring gull taken on the east coast, uh, basically I knew I wanted to put the gull to the right hand side to give it more space to look into. And then it was a case of how far, whether to have the bird higher in the frame or lower in the frame, depending whether I wanted more sea or more of the foreground flowers. I've basically got the bird where two of those lines intersect according to the rule of thirds. And I think that's given a really pleasing composition I'm going to give a shout out to Tom Mason who did a fantastic video on composition in wildlife photography. I'll put a link up on the top of the screen and also in the description box. Tom did a fantastic video, goes into it much deeper than I have in how to use lines and splitting up into triangles and all kinds of things like that. Really, really good. Highly recommend that video. Uh, for me, what I find most interesting about composition is, is how you can use different elements in the frame just to, uh, just to enhance everything. And I'm going to give you some examples now of a few images that I've taken which illustrate that. Uh, so the first one here is a reed bunting in song, absolutely beautiful little birds. And what I've done here, originally I was, there was nothing between me and the reed bunting. I was photographing it on the twig that it had chosen to sing from. But then I realized there's a gorse bush over to the left hand side. And if I positioned myself so the gorse bush, there, the gorse bush was between me and the reed bunting, uh, then I could get something really nice. So what I've done, I've moved over to the left, got the bush between us. And what that's allowed is for me to get those beautiful yellow flowers out of focus in the foreground, not just only adds color, but also adds almost a bit of framing around the reed bunting as well. This image was uh, a nesting white stork taken on one of my photography tours out in Serbia. Um, this was just really interesting. There was a lot going on here. I was fascinated by the different elements that you could include in the composition. Uh, so we took a couple of closer shots with the 500 mil and then I've stepped back still with the 500 mil lens I've stepped back and I've tried to include other things as well so I've included the uh, the wires from the electricity pylon and I've also included a bit of the green tree as well so it's just added more elements to the frame shows a bit more habitat tells more of a story and I really like the composition also we've got some lines coming in there from those wires and that aids to the composition as well this image of a group of young fallow deer uh, taken up in North Yorkshire. We couldn't get, literally couldn't get physically closer because there's a huge gully between us and the deer. So what I tried to do is just to use the surroundings to make the image more interesting. So it's not just about the deer, it's about the surroundings as well. There's some beautiful autumn colours at the time, beautiful colours on the leaves, on the trees. So what I've done here is to try and compose the shot with the deer uh, the bottom of the frame and then just allow the trees with the nice leaves to frame it around the outside. Uh, this image of a red-throated diver taken in Iceland, one of my favourite places a few years ago, uh, taken with a 400mm lens. I uh, taken some horizontal landscape shots and then realised that we could just about see the snow-capped mountain in the background so I've turned the camera vertically. That's allowed me to include the mountain in the image behind it. So I've got the bird at the bottom of the frame, water, bit of land, and then we've got the mountain. And you just about get the suggestion of the snow on the top of the mountain there. Always think about turning the camera vertically. Does it actually make a better composition if you shoot it in the vertical format? Speaking of vertical format, this is a good point to mention reflections. So if you're working with water, at any point you're working with subjects on the water, wildfowl, ducks and grease and 
grebes, then I would say make sure you look for reflections. If it's still enough, there's a good chance you'll be able to include the reflection. So don't just photograph the bird, try and see if you can get the reflection in there as well. Get two for the price of one. And again, it might be the case that turning the camera vertically is going to work out better, but it really depends. You can do it horizontally, vertically, depending how far away you are. So in this example here of a mute swan, really simple image. Unfortunately, the the, the water is actually quite mucky. It's not very clean at all. Um, but it's far enough away that I've been able to turn the camera vertically and I've got the swan and I've got the entire reflection in there as well. This video is also part of the wildlife photography tutorial playlist. If you have a look at that playlist, you'll find lots of useful how-to videos in there. Wider shots can be really interesting because you, you can show more of the habitat, more of the surroundings. And I'm a really big fan of those types of more environmental images. So if you can shoot a bit wider, you can use more of the surroundings and different elements to aid the composition. I'm going to show you a few examples now. The first one, which is a damselfly photographed with a 100mm macro. And rather than go for a real close-up here, which I often will do and I enjoy, but I've actually backed off just to include more of the environment, almost as an impression, uh, with a shallow depth of field, more of an impressionistic effect. And again, if you follow the rule of thirds, you probably find that the damselfly is very close to where two of those lines intersect. Uh, so again, just coming a little bit further back has allowed me to give more of a suggestion of the environment. This beater photographed in Serbia at a, a large colony, uh, we did quite a few close-ups, but we also had a perch that was a bit further away, and this has enabled us to take wider, more environmental shots. And here, rather than just put the beater in the centre of the frame, I've composed the image so that the bird is at the top of the frame, and that's allowed more of the flowers to show at the bottom. So we get loads of those lovely purple flowers in the bottom of the frame, which adds some really nice colour to the composition. This image, this is not the sharpest image by any means. It was taken a long time ago uh, on a 40D, 20D or a 40D. Well, basically I was lucky enough uh, to see these two roe deer, one chasing the other right across the middle of the field. And if I put them in the center of the frame, then I would have had some of that background, but I would have also had quite a lot of blank, boring grass in the foreground. Here I realised that the background was much more interesting than the foreground, so I positioned the deer to the bottom of the frame and I just absolutely loved those lines. It was kind of like a, a frosted crop, I think, providing these diagonal lines. So I've wanted to include more of that in the frame and also got some interesting lines to add a bit of a pattern to the image. With this image of a red grouse, similar again, I positioned the subject right at the bottom of the frame. Here I've turned the camera vertically, again, because this allowed me to include more of the habitat. If I'd kept it horizontal, uh, I would have had more of the heather that it was in, and I've had a bit of the background with the stone walls, etc. But turning the camera vertically meant that I could include much more of that expanse of the classic Yorkshire Dales landscape of stone walls and fields in the background. And I really love this environmental image. It shows the bird in its habitat. So it can be the case sometimes less is more. The opposite of wider shots to include the habitat, you could actually go in closer. So if you have a situation as I did here with these black-headed gulls roosting in Prague, which is just an amazing experience to see, photographed at twilight, uh, I'd love to do a video on this. In fact, I'd love to go back and do a video on it. Uh, but basically there was just literally hundreds of these birds and they were all roosting together on their, on these icebreakers, I think they're called. I took some wide shots, but the pattern was just amazing. It was making such a natural pattern. You've got these really strong artificial diagonal lines and then you've got these natural round shapes of the gulls and there's even contrasting colours and textures in there as well and I found it fascinating. So here I've just really gone in closer, uh, used a 100mm lens and I've gone in closer to just try and crop in uh, and not include too much of the external environment just to go and concentrate purely on that pattern and texture. I'm going to mention something now that I think very few people would mention. When you're composing an image you'll usually be doing it to make it more interesting to the viewer. Uh, maybe it's just for yourself or it might be for a competition uh, where you're trying to use the rules of composition to really draw attention to the subject and hold attention from the viewer. Uh, but if you are actually trying to sell the image, then it can be better to break those rules entirely. Uh, so in that case, if you were trying to sell it, say 
for editorial purposes, for example, it might actually be better to deliberately put a lot of space in the image. So it's not as pleasing uh, in terms of composition to the eye, but what you're doing is just leaving loads of space, which allows an editor to put some text in there. So this example of a robin, where I've positioned the bird right over to the right hand side. So it's much more extreme. And the reason for doing that is simply that this lends itself more to editorial content. So if an editor wants to put some text on that left hand side, there's bags of space, really nice, clean, smooth backdrop, perfect for putting text on. Uh, this would maybe lend itself to a double page spread, for example, with some text on the left hand side. So if you're really trying to shoot images to sell them, certainly for stock, then you definitely want to think about leaving space around your image maybe to one side or perhaps even all around the image. So please remember everything I've told you is really just a guide. Uh, rules are made to be broken. You can rip them up, do whatever you want in your own photography. It's your picture. Hopefully some of these images and the guidelines are just going to help you along the way. If you're interested in seeing more tutorial videos from me, then click the playlist that's up here. If you'd like to see me out in the field photographing wildlife and giving you some tips along the way, then click this playlist. And please subscribe if you're not already. And stay well everybody and I'll see you next time.